Uh, I think now David Sandelow uh, is going to present uh, the new research. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jason. Uh, thank you for your inspired leadership of, of the Center on Global Energy Policy. Uh, it was a lot of fun and a great privilege to work with Jason and government, and it's been both of those things to work together at this new Center on Global Energy Policy. Uh, thank you to Steve and Professor Zhang for co-hosting this event for the dialogue today, which was tremendous. Um, and I'm looking forward to the discussion tonight. My assignment tonight is to talk about China and energy. And as I thought about this, I realized that talking about China and energy with Minister Zhang Guobao in the room <laughs> is kind of like talking with, about physics with Albert Einstein in the room. <laughs> or maybe being asked to talk about a flood with Moses in the room. <laughs> so I'm not going to go into incredibly deep detail because the man who really knows what he's talking about is on stage after me. But what I thought I would do in the few minutes I have tonight is offer a few thoughts about some of the basic facts about China and energy, just to get us grounded, for those of you who aren't experts in this, and then talk about a report that we're releasing tonight on a specific topic, which is shale gas in China. And I'll go into some detail about a, a new a report, an 80-page report that we're releasing that you can pick up on, on the way out the door. So I kind of start by reflecting on my first trip to China, which was in the summer of 1981. I, I had the great privilege of being an exchange student in one of the first groups of exchange students to go to China after normalization of relations between our two countries. It was actually a Columbia University program at Hua Deng Chifan Dashui in Shanghai. And this, a couple of years ago, I went looking for a picture of Shanghai from 1981. And I found this one, it's actually 1983, it's two years after I was there, but that's the Bun, that's the, Shang, that's the waterfront in, in 1983, just two years after I was there, that's the same place today. So that's 1981. And in my adult lifetime, that has changed to that. That requires a lot of energy. China has gone through remarkable transformation in the past several decades. People have called it history and fast forward. And the implications for the global energy system have been profound. Let me just talk about a few of them. First, China is today the world's largest energy consumer and producer, both. It has had quite a remarkable decade. Um, I'm going to mainly talk about the future, but I, I thought this was such a dramatic graph that it was worth showing. The, uh, the dark gray line is US en or bars are US energy consumption. And the red is Chinese energy consumption. And on the left, I don't know if everybody can see it, it's the year 2000. And the right is 2010. So in the decade between 2000 and 2010, China moved from about half of US energy consumption to more than US energy consumption. Remarkable growth during that period. China today uses approximately half of the world's coal, slightly less in 2012, but it's probably trended up to be slightly more today. And this is, I think, the last slide I'm going to show about the past. But this shows the same phenomenon for China during the decade I was just talking about. The re and the, the top line there is global consumption excluding China of coal. And then you see China's coal consumption trending up. Um, so that, it, and in the, this, chart actually ends in 2011, and the year since it's now um, reached the point that China uses, another way of saying it is China uses as much coal as the rest of the world combined. China's the world's leading oil importer. That threshold was just passed uh, about six months ago um, in the last quarter of last year. Um, the, the red line here are China's net oil imports, the blue line are the US net oil imports. U.S. net oil imports have been declining as our auto efficiency has been improving dramatically and our oil production has been increasing in combination, therefore driving our net imports down to re levels we haven't seen. I, uh, I was told today by top EIA official 
that uh, they're projecting that U.S. imports of oil will be only 20% in, uh, in calendar year 2015. Um, which is uh, dramatic in comparison where we were just a few years ago. Meanwhile, China's are trending slightly up, and they are the world's largest net oil importer. Uh, and there's a reason for that. China is the number one country in new car sales, with more than 20 million cars sold last year, 20 million new cars sold last year. But here's what I think is in some ways the most astounding statistic on that front. China today has a vehicle fleet or a vehicle park, it's sometimes called, of about 137 million vehicles. That is ballpark, what, one in nine? About one vehicle for every nine Chinese people or um, between eight and ten. Um, the United States has one vehicle for every person. Okay, so China has one vehicle for every eight people. The United States has one for everyone. The growth that's going to continue in the Chinese vehicle fleet is dramatic, um, with dramatic implications for oil markets globally. China is the number one country in the world on solar installations. China has for many, many years been the leading manufacturer <laughs> of solar panels, and we're selling those solar panels around the world. In the past year, they have also become the major consumer of solar panels, installing in uh, 2013 more than 11 gigawatts uh, of solar power, and that's only going up. Um, it's uh, projected to actually increase pretty dramatically um, in, in the next couple of years. Um, and here's just a little more information with, about the distribution globally. It's, it's interesting, China's 29% of global PV or photovoltaic installations. Japan behind that, US is, is, uh, is third that list. So in the United States today, in all of our buildings around the country, we have about 300 billion square feet of floor space. China is going to add that much floor space in its buildings in the next 15 to 20 years. So China in the next 15 or 20 years is projected to build as much square footage in buildings as exists in United States buildings today. So I think, for example, if you are looking for an inflection point, something that could have a significant impact on, for example, greenhouse gas emissions, improving the efficiency of the Chinese building fleet is about as good an inflection point as you could find, or about as good a tool as you could find. Um, buildings use a lot of energy. The more efficient Chinese buildings are, the less energy will be consumed and the less greenhouse gases um, will be emitted. On the topic of energy efficiency, by the way, China um, uh, is not uh, very energy efficient. Um, if you look at um, the, me the typical measure that's used by energy experts, it's energy consumed per unit of GDP. Um, and in 2010, China, uh, as you see here at uh, 10,000, it's, it's uh, BTU per unit of GDP, um, which was significantly more than India, US, EU, and Japan. That's partly the legacy of a, of a socialist system. Um, it moves towards more of a market economy. But um, what this means, another way of saying this, is there are tremendous energy efficiency opportunities in China. There are tremendous opportunities to save money profitably, to save energy profitably uh, in China right now. And the Chinese government's been extremely focused on that with some very tough energy efficiency targets um, in the five-year planning process. So looking forward some, um, I thought this was interesting. These are energy consumption projections from the US Energy Information um, Administration. They, you see the, this is energy, it's energy consumption. They cross around 2010. Net energy consumption, or, or energy consumption in the United States is projected to stay flat for the next several decades. And you see the growth in China um, that's projected. China's building half of the world's new nuclear plants today. Um, uh, the, the, the future of the world nuclear industry is being shaped in China. There are American reactors, uh, reactors from a number of different countries. Um, that are being, being built in China. There was a pause for a safety review after, um, after Fukushima um, that Minister Zhang and I, um, when we were both in government, spent time talking about. Um, and, and right now there is um, a full steam ahead with some very um, important um, nuclear power uh, construction in China, which, by the way, is, means much less in the way of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, since these, it's zero carbon electricity. And on the topic of carbon, um, China is the world's largest emitter of carbon dioxide, um, and that's a trend that's going to continue. 
There is no solution to the global warming problem that doesn't involve both China and the United States absolutely centrally as, as key players. I thought this is an interesting slide, and, and for those of you who are experts, I think this is an interesting topic that, that um, is, is worth some further look. There are huge variations within China um, in industri industrialization and energy use in different parts of the country. This is a map which shows the distribution of industrial CO2 intensities in different parts of the countries with higher concentrations in Ordos and Xinjiang. Um, but I think this, this is actually an area that's um, ripe for some academic research um, and looking at the different, uh, different distributions within China uh, and different energy, energy use. So what I want to do with the rest of my time which, um, is talk about maybe one of the areas in which China is not a major player in the energy area, and that's natural gas. So China is actually a fairly small user of natural gas at this point. It, it is a small portion of China's um, energy mix, as you can see in this chart. The, the, the blue is coal, and if you can see it, the yellow is natural gas. It's only 4% of total energy consumption in China, um, and the world average um, is 24%. Um, so China uses much less natural gas on average than um, the rest of the world does. Uh, the, the Chinese government has established goals to increase that, partly because of air pollution um, challenges, and, and um, uh, has, has goals to increase natural gas consumption and production within China. Um, one of the interesting opportunities that China has in, in increasing its natural gas production and consumption is shale gas. China, China's shale gas resources are vast. By some estimates, they're the biggest in the world. Um, that's what the U.S. Inf Energy Information Agency says, and here you see um, rank order according to U.S. EIA, China has the biggest shale gas resources in the world, followed by uh, Argentina, Algeria, and then the U.S. as number four. There's great interest in China, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, their pretty aggressive goals in terms of producing that shale gas. Um, I, I thought this was interesting. So we've been working on this report, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. So I've been following the media on shale gas. So the Economist had a story last week, and I don't know if you can read the headline, but the headline underneath shale game, it says, China drastically reduces its ambitions to be a big shale gas producer. I thought that was interesting because the day before I had read a story from Reuters <laughs> said China energy giants turn upbeat on shale gas. So there's a lot of, and by the way, these, weren't, these aren't predictions. These are two major media outlets reporting what people in China are saying now about shale gas in exactly the opposite way. So there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of confusion, and, and partly for that reason, we thought it might be valuable to, uh, at Columbia Center on Global Energy Policy to do a major study on this. And with a team of people um, have been doing that for the past couple of months, and we're releasing it tonight. So it's going to be up on the web tonight. You can get copies as, as you leave. We hope it'll be an important resource um, for this issue in, in the weeks and months ahead. We're releasing a working draft tonight. And we're going to get some more comment on it and release a final version um, in, in the months ahead. Um, I have some co-authors. Is, is Ching here? Ching Yang? Where is Ching? There's Ching. So one of, one of the co-authors who did tremendous work on this project. Uh, and is Jing Chao here? Jing, yeah, so Jing Chao is another one of the co-authors. He, uh, he just got a job in Washington, and he, he's on the train here. He told me his train was delayed. Um, but, uh, but he'll be here. But, um, but, but Ching Yang and, uh, and Jing Chao Wu have done tremendous work um, on this report. So thank you, Ching. Thank you, Jing Chao, as well as two authors who were, who were resident in um, Beijing, um, Anders Hove and Hunda Lin. Let me say a little bit about what we did. Um, first, for those of you who aren't broadly familiar with the US shale gas revolution, let me just say a word about that. Um, here's a chart from US EIA. It's on the right is shale gas production over the last uh, 14 years. Um, and we've had an amazing revolution in shale gas production um, in the United States, going from essentially nothing to um, uh, almost, almost half, not quite, but almost half of US natural gas production um, in the past couple of years. Um, it's had um, uh, dramatically uh, favorable impacts on our economy, um, creating lots of jobs. Um, it's helped to drive U.S. Um, greenhouse gas emissions down to their lowest level in 20 years, interestingly, as, as natural gas has, has replaced coal. Um, and, uh, and interesting geostrategic implications, too. The United States is moving towards becoming a net exporter of natural gas. Um, so we in our project um, looked at what led to the U.S. shale gas revolution. Um, and 
I don't have time to go into a lot of detail, but this is, it's in our report. But here's the factors that we identified from talking to experts. A large and high quality shale resource, a competitive market system. And by the way, this competitive market system, it's worth reminding ourselves, actually, in the United States, we didn't have a competitive market system for natural gas until about 30 years ago. We actually had price controls on natural gas until the 1980s um, in the United States. But we've had one since a uh, competitive system since the 1980s. We have private property rights here, so if you want to sell your um, mineral rights, you can do it. Um, we had significant federal government support for R&D. The role of the federal government in the shale gas revolution was central, in my judgment, having read the literature on this. Um, federal tax incentives were very important. Um, another key piece was publicly available data. It's interesting, as I talked to shale gas um, entrepreneurs in the past couple of months, Every one of them, or many of them, most of them, I should say, identified the fact of publicly available geologic data as being extremely important to their ability to produce shale gas. They, they go and they look for the shale where they know it's going to be as a result of the public data. And then we, we have an extensive pipeline network and entrepreneurial culture. Our methodology was to um, take a look at what's happening in China and compare it to what's happening in the United States and draw some results based on that. Here are our findings, and I, I spent too long in the first part of the report. I'm going to have to rush through part of this, I think, but um, I apologize for that. But let me just quickly tell you what our findings are. In, in the next few years, Chinese shale gas production is not going to be substantial. I don't think anybody expects that it will be. China has drilled today about 200 shale gas wells compared to about 100,000 in the United States. So it's just starting in China. And in the years ahead, you can plausibly construct scenarios for either very high growth or low growth scenarios. I think either one is possible. There are a series of barriers I apologize, there's a lot of text here, but there's a series of barriers that are important, including extremely high production costs, weak incentives for state-owned enterprises, lack of competition, restrictions on foreign businesses, and limited data availability. Uh, in China today, in contrast to the situation I was describing with publicly available data in the United States, most of the data is held by state-owned enterprises, um, and there's actually state secrets laws that um, restrict the availability of da geologic data. We found that policies are key to the future of the shale gas um, development in, in China. The geology of shale in China is not very well known. Much of the, what is known is proprietary. But whatever the rock formations um, look like as they're drilled, the policy environment is going to be central um, uh, to developing China shale. Let me quick tell you, today China has production targets um, for shale gas. Um, production subsidies. As I said, it's a priority of the, of the central government. It's about a, almost, a little short of $2, two dollars per thousand cubic feet. That production subsidy expires in 2015. There are waivers of price controls, um, which are important. And we looked intensively at provincial policies as well. And the role of provinces is very important. I don't have time to talk about it now, but if you're interested, our report has a fair amount of information about what's happening in the provinces on shale gas. We spent a fair amount of time looking at environmental impacts, uh, which are absolutely critical here. And th the simple fact is the environmental impacts of shale gas in China could range anywhere from very positive to very negative. Um, shale gas in China could displace coal-fired power generation, and it could displace coal to gas, which has an even worse carbon footprint than coal-fired power generation. Shale gas could replace that. and, and some of the energy experts here will know that, that burning methane, burning natural gas, has about half the carbon footprint of carbon dioxide. Um, but if that methane leaks into the atmosphere, it's going to have a worse global warming impact. Um, and if there aren't appropriate controls for water pollution, that's going to be a problem. So the environmental impacts could range anywhere from positive to negative. Water supply constraints are potentially serious. In, in the short term, they are probably not an issue. Most of the early shale gas production in China is happening in Sichuan um, and in Chongqing, where there's plenty of water. Um, but in the longer and medium, in the medium and long term, shale gas is going to expand into areas that have real limited water availability, and that's going to be a potential issue. And here's, here's an important point, I guess, at least as a former government official, uh, I was struck thinking about this. Um, th this is an area where the US and Chinese governments share common goals. Um, and it's interesting, both the U.S. and Chinese governments have seen it in their interest to develop shale gas in China. What I hear from Chinese government officials when I talk to them is that they would like to develop shale gas for environmental reasons and economic reasons and geostrategic reasons. The United States government has 
worked very closely with the Chinese government to promote shale gas development for some of the same reasons, thinking that it's going to be good for the environment, it's, they're good export opportunities for U.S. companies, and the geostrategic aspects of this are good, reducing pressure on global natural gas markets. Um, scenario we have common goals. So we have a series of recommendations. I'm not going to have a chance to get into them because I'm, I'm running out of time. But, but we offer, based upon our analysis of the U.S. situation, um, recommendations for consideration of Chinese policymakers, um, uh, accelerating market-based reforms, natural gas price reforms, speeding pipeline reforms, encouraging competition for mineral rights and improving data availability, providing a clear roadmap for foreign companies. And we have in this report, for those of you who are in the oil and gas industry, we have a model production sharing contract, which uh, Ching Yang with, uh, played a, a central role in developing. So thank you, Ching. Um, and we hope this will be a resource to the industry as they, uh, as they work in this area. Um, one I particularly want to focus on, just as I close, is investing in innovation. Because if there's going to be shale gas development in China, it's going to require innovation of different kinds. Um, at a minimum, it's going to require innovation in some of the equipment that's used for shale gas development. We talked to people who said it's going to require basic innovation in terms of um, hydraulic fracturing and the basic techniques around hydraulic fracturing. And we also heard a lot about, about lack of coordination among ministries, and we recommend uh, improved coordination as well. The, the U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Center has been a flagship project on innovation between the two countries. We recommend um, a new uh, program within the U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Center um, on, uh, on shale gas as part of our report. So let me, let me just close where I began. Um, I was thinking there's a generation of students today who were traveling to China for the first time and experience in, of, of, here in, of American students. And I think many of them, it's interesting, as they go to Beijing for the first time, you know, my experience, I, I flew from Los Angeles to Shanghai 30, 33 years ago. I left Los Angeles, the air was unbelievably polluted. It was, uh, it was so polluted in Los Angeles that you couldn't see the mountains from a skyscraper. And I arrived in Shanghai, and the air was totally clean, of course. <laughs> so last year I had an experience, actually, I did almost the reverse trip. I flew from Beijing on a day where the PM 2.5 was over 300. Uh, and I flew from there to Los Angeles. And as I was driving on Los Angeles towards downtown from the airport, the air was crystal clear. Absolutely beautiful. And you could see the mountains. And, and what that says to me is, it, it, you know, it, it is the United States in the past 30 years, I actually think we've done a lot of things poorly my, in my country. One thing we've actually done pretty well is clean the air in our cities. We still have a fair amount to do on that, but we've been reasonably successful in cleaning the air in our cities. The air in New York is much cleaner than it was 30, 30 years ago. And China can do the same thing. Um, and you know, as China gets serious about cleaning the air in the cities, uh, many people here in the United States would like to be a partner. We'd like to be a partner in a number of ventures. Um, and uh, we look forward to 30 years from now, some, somebody will stand up here and say, you wouldn't believe it. When I went to Beijing, the PM2.5 was 300. You, you can't believe how dirty the air was. Now the air in Beijing is crystal clear. Thank you very much. We, we're technically over time, <laughs> and we're late on our Sorry. schedule. Uh, so let me just uh, we'll just ask sort of take three or four minutes to maybe ask you know just two questions, uh, and then we, we we're deeply honored tonight to have Minister Zhang Gabao here, and we don't want to uh, take any time away from him, and want to make sure he has as much uh, time as possible. Uh, also, um, the Dean of Columbia School of International Public Affairs, I see over here, Merit Jainau. So I want to welcome her and thank her for being here, uh, who has knows many of you because of her deep expertise in China as well. So thanks for joining us. Um, so you laid. I, I'm just curious. You you said it. You kind of said it could be. I'm going to like, uh, just put you on the spot. It could be a big deal. It could be a small deal. <laughs> and you kind of laid out what it'll take to go in those different directions. Uh, there are many people here who have deep familiarity with uh, the inside workings of the Chinese government. But could you, do you have a sense for are things headed on if one wants to produce a lot of shale gas on the right track now or not? How optimistic are you uh, about which of those two tracks we're on? So uh, of the barriers that we identify in the report, Jason, there are a few that there are, there's clear movement on within the Chinese government. I mean, we, for example, we point to um, price controls a, as a barrier. And, and um, they, they were a barrier here in the United States for natural gas development. When we lifted them, natural gas development grew. 
the, in, in China today, there is very significant move towards reform of natural gas pricing. Um, there's also a move towards reform of pipeline regulation, which is a slightly more complicated topic. There are a few areas where we identified as, as important where I think there's less movement. And the, the one that stuck out to me was uh, data availability. Uh, I think lots of uh, the entrepreneurs we talked to here in the United States said the availability of data, basic data about the geology is hugely important to us. Um, and I, I'm not aware of moves within the Chinese system to make that data more available. And you kind of gave a laundry list of policy measures you think are necessary. And if you were to, as you know, as a foreign policymaker, you got to pick and choose your battle. So if you were to prioritize a little bit, if you could do one thing tomorrow, uh, if you were sort of in charge of Chinese energy policy for a day, what, what, what would be the most significant thing that, would, that, would, that, that you could do to change I, I want to be really careful and respectful about answering that question because I'm not. <laughs> and, and, and I, and I'm not, and I'm an American, and, and part, you know, I, I respect the... Um, Chinese people and the Chinese governments choosing their own goals here. And, and it, but in the, terms of the, the, the Chinese, the Chinese, the, the Chinese government has decided that sh producing shale gas is an objective and a goal. Um, and uh, and if, if that's going to happen, I, think the, I hope the report provides a useful resource of the types of changes that might help contribute to that. And like I just said, changing I think the data is a sensitive issue, but but a review of that policy is. I was just wondering if some of the barriers were kind of seen more significant than others. Yeah. No, um, I think, yeah. Uh, and then let me just ask one last question. You mentioned we cleaned up the air in the U.S. Uh, we did that without stopping. We've used less coal, but we still use a lot of coal. Yeah. We've used technology to make coal cleaner from an air quality perspective, not a climate change perspective. Um, so I'm curious about, you often hear people say we're going to see a sharp decline in coal usage, a sharp increase in natural gas usage because of air pollution concerns. Um, do you think that is necessarily the case, or might it be the case that coal continues to power the economy uh, and, and local pollution is dealt with, but not greenhouse gas emissions? Well, this is, I'm going to partly duck that question since <laughs> Minister Zhang is the expert on that topic. Uh, um, but let me, let me just say that you know, coal is a huge percentage of Chinese energy mix today. And even as it trends downward, it will still remain a huge percentage uh, of Chinese, uh, the Chinese energy mix. And I think Mr. Zhang can give a lot more detail on that question. So that's a good transition. Uh, so we're, uh, we'll, we'll ask Steve to please introduce uh, Minister Zhang Gaobao. And thank you uh, again, David, for that uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. I don't want to use any time introducing Zhang Guobao, but it, it's, um, I've known a lot of ministers over my 38 year career of, of dealing with China. I'm not sure, I was trying to think when I was with you this morning, have I ever known one who has served in his position as a minister, in fact, in the most powerful min ministry, the, development, the Reform and Development Commission, who was a vice minister for 13 years. It's truly extraordinary, and if this morning was any indication I know exactly why they kept you in that position for so long, because you really remarkably frank, remarkably straightforward, and remarkably well-informed. So please join me in welcoming Minister Zhang Guobao. Good evening, dear guests. It's my pleasure to be invited to make a speech in this forum. Uh, I prepared a paper about uh, China and the United Energy Issues, uh, but I didn't write in English. I can speak some English, no problem. <laughs> but I think Chinese is better than English. <laughs> so let me uh, still speak in Chinese and let the interpreter help me. It's OK. Uh, tonight, I want to talk about uh, three topics. The one is China energy situation and the China United Energy situation that compares the two countries situation. Next, uh, and, and let me speak in Chinese, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can speak, but I think uh, I want to speak in Chinese, it's, it's better than me. 中国自实行改革开放政策三十五年来,经济持续高速增长。in the 35 years since China has begun on the pathway toward economic reform and openness, our, our economy has developed incredibly quickly and continuously, and our energy usage has met the same pace. 
It was in 93, as you said, that China became a net energy importer. 二零零九年，又从煤炭的出口大国，变成了煤炭进进口国家。I'm sorry. That was oil importer in '93, and in 2009,、uh, China changed from being a net coal exporter to being a net coal importer as well. 特别是从二零零二年克服了亚洲金融危机以后，连续十年能源生产和需求高速增长。Particularly since 2002, in the after we had recovered from the Asian flu. Uh, that round of economic、um, hardship, then the, our、uh, economy developed particularly rapidly, and our energy needs developed as well. 二零一三年，能源消费达到三十七点六亿吨标准煤。Um, so、uh, in two two thousand thirteen, our total energy consumption consumption reached、um, uh, thirty six trillion. Three point seven six billion. Uh, standard coal. Thank you. The equal, uh, two point six three billion ton crude oil. Okay. Uh, standard oil. Yeah. This number, ah, exceeded the United States, making the United States the world's largest oil producing country and consuming country. So this, of course, surpassed the U.S. figure, making China the the world's largest importer and user of energy. This, of course, surpassed the U.S. figure, making China the the world's largest importer and user of energy. Uh, no, no, no.、Oh. Uh, become the the largest. Production and the consumer countries. Okay, thank you. China's energy consumption is now twenty-two point four percent of all energy consumption in the world. America is now twenty-two point four percent of all energy consumption in the world. U.S. the U.S. represents just twenty-two percent even of total world energy consumption. 所以，中美两国是世界上最大的能源生产国和消费国。So obviously, both the U.S. and China are among the largest producers and consumers of energy in the world. 但是，由于中国人口是美国的四倍多，所以人均年能源消费为二点七吨标准煤，就一个中国人一年消费二点七吨标准煤的能量。Mm-hmm. So the,、um, however, of course, China's population is more than four times that of the United States. So on a per capita basis, China's consumption of energy is still、um, just 2.7 tons per year of standard coal、um, uh, in, in total energy use per capita. This number just exceeded the average annual consumption of energy in the world, which is 2.6 tons per year of standard coal per capita. This number just exceeded the average annual consumption of energy in the world, which is 2.6 tons per year of standard coal per capita. So this is just a tiny bit above the the total global average of 2.6 standard tons of coal per year per capita. 呃，中国人均消费还不到美国人均年消费量的三分之一。In another way of putting that is that our per capita use of of energy is still less than one third that of U.S. per capita use. 中国的电力也快速增长。Our, our use of electricity is also very、uh, rapidly increasing. 二零一三年，中国的电力总装机容量已经达到十二点四八亿千瓦。十二点四。是，我来翻这个哈。呃 ，last year the total storage capacity already reached one point two four eight trillion watt. Trillion watt. Okay. 也略微超过美国总装机十二亿千瓦 ，a little over America the total storage, one point two trillion watt. 嗯，但人均用电水平，美国人一年用电一万三千二百二十七千瓦时。But In terms of per capita usage, the U.S.、Um, uh, u- u- annual usage per capita is about thirteen thousand two hundred and twenty-seven kilowatt hours. 在全世界排名第七位。Uh, we, we, the, that's so. That's the seventh highest in the world. I range the seven in the world. The number one is I- Iceland. Okay. Iceland. Oh, Iceland. Bingo. Bingo. Iceland. Iceland. America Iceland. is number seven. <laughs> <laughs> 而中国人均年用电是两千九百一十二千瓦时，在世界上排名三十二位。Uh, 
on a per capita basis, Chinese, China's electric use is just 2,912 kilowatt hours per year, which makes um, China number 32 in per capita electric, electric use in the world. In the world, I range the uh, 32. In other words, the Americans on a per capita basis use 4.5 times the electricity that Chinese do. 而且人均,那么人均的生活用电,美国就比中国就更高了。这个前面讲的是包括工业用电都在内。Now, the, the previous figure includes both industrial and uh, individual use, household use. If you look at household use only, the, the gap between American and Chinese use is even larger. 中国从1993年,就是那一年开始,中国变成进进可过,但是那一年只进可了原油6万吨。Mm. Um, I just mentioned that China became a net importer of oil in the year 1993. Um, in that year, we imported just 60,000 tons of oil. 但是到了2013年,就是去年,中国进进可原油2.8亿吨。2.8亿。So, uh, but as of uh, 2013, the year just passed, our, our net imports of oil were in fact 280 million tons of, of crude. Yes. Uh, 原油的对外预存度达到了 um, yeah, And uh, imported crude is now 58% of all of our total petroleum use. Uh, in, uh, no. Oh. Uh, the imported crude oil, the take uh, 58 percentage now. Yeah. That it's 58% of uh, our crude oil used in China. We needed to import uh, uh, 58 percentage crude oil from international market. Yes. 天然气, 2013年, um, and uh, in terms of uh, imports of natural gas in 2013, we imported um, uh, 53, 53 billion cubic, 3 cubic, billion cubic, cubic, cubic yeah. last year. LNG, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, and among that, LNG represented um, uh, one 17 million, million ton. 17 million ton LNG import. 天然气的对外预存度达到了 31.6%. And uh, the, the, the natural gas, um, the, 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 the percentage of all natural gas use in China that was based on imported gas was 31.6%. 天然气在中国的能源结构当中只占百分之五十八。天然气在所有的,so natural gas. Uh, natural gas only take 4.8% in the total energy mix. 这个美国呢是天然气在能源结构当中占百分之二十四。Whereas in the U.S. that figure is twenty-four percent. 但是中国已经成为世界上第三大的天然气消费国。But um, China is already the third largest consumer of natural gas in the world. 二零一三年，中国进口了二点七亿吨的煤炭。um, in uh, 2013, China imported 270 million tons of coal. Uh, um, 5 million tons of this was imported from the United States. I in the 13 years that I acted in it worked in the ministry I couldn't have imagined that such a heavy product would be sent across the Pacific to us here in China. <笑><笑> 实际上,中国一次能源的自给率仍然高达90%,只有10%是进口的。Um, 
however, we, we should also recognize that when we're looking at the total energy usage in China, even though it's, a, as David just talked about, as it's an issue that a lot of us are very concerned about, the truth is we are more independent than it may appear. If you look at our total energy usage across all forms, um, only 10% of it is dependent on imports. 90% of it we supply our own energy needs. Um, so for the most part, we import two products, crude, petroleum, and natural gas. 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 As David just just mentioned, in primary energy use in China, coal is the the largest factor, 67.5 percent. 呃，中国的这一点上和印度的能源结构差不多啊。印度大概煤炭也占这么大的比例。In that sense, we're much closer to India's situation than to the United States. 而美国的煤炭在能源结构当中只占不到百分之三十。And that, by contrast, in the United States, my understanding is coal supplies less than 30 percent of total energy use. 美国的核电占总发电量的百分之二十。Um, uh, in the U.S., um, nuclear uh, uh, power industries are uh, nu nuclear power plants are about 20 percent of total and electricity production. Yeah, 呃，有一百个核电反应堆。With more than a hundred um, nuclear power reactors, uh, operating. Mm. Before have a uh, hundred four, but uh, close the four. <laughs> now have a hundred uh, <laughs> nuclear station still operating. And China nuclear power only has two percent of our total electricity production. At present, nuclear power production in China is only two percent of our total electricity production. Now, China has only twenty-eight nuclear power reactors operating. Only 28 nuclear reactors are in operation in China today. But just now, David Sandler 先生说，中国在建的核电站占世界的将近一半，这是真的。因为中国现在在建的核电站有三十个，啊，全世界只有六十四个核电站在建，但是中国占了其中三十个。Um, but what uh, David Sandelow just said is also true, uh, that, that of new production of nuclear, power, re nuclear reactors, we are half of the world's production. As to, for, to my knowledge, there are 64 nuclear reactors currently being built throughout the world, 30 of them in China. So, it, it must be admitted that it, at present, the cleanliness of energy production in the United States is much greater than that of China. Um, but that we, we are working in that direction. Sustainable energy production is a major goal, both in terms of wind and in solar pr power production. We're making great strides. So in, the, in 2003, the year that I became minister, there were only 480 megawatts of uh, wind power being produced in China. Which made us roughly equal with total production of wind power in the United States. China is the world's largest nuclear power plant. As David Sandelow said, we are the largest producer of photovoltaics in the world now. Yes, we are the largest producer of photovoltaics. We are the largest producer of photovoltaics in the world now. Yes, we are the largest producer of photovoltaics in the world now. Yes, we are the largest producer of photovoltaics in the world now. Yes, we are the largest producer of photovoltaics in the world now. Yes, we are the largest producer of photovoltaics in the world now. Yes, we are the largest producer of photovoltaics in the world now. Yes, we are the largest producer of photovoltaics in the world now. Yes, we are the largest producer of photovoltaics in the world now. Yes, we are the largest producer of photovoltaics in the world now. Yes, we are the largest producer of photovoltaics in the world now. Yes, we are the largest producer of photovoltaics in the world now. Yes, we are the largest producer of photovoltaics in the world now. Yes, we are the largest producer of photovoltaics in the world now. Yes, we are um, we are most, but however, we need to import many of the key components and materials for all the photovoltaics produced in in China, uh, including the the the, the coated silicon um, uh, uh, wafers, and these are mostly from a German company called Wack, Wack and, and American Dalkani. 
但是由于欧盟和美国对中国太阳能电池进行双方调查，提高关税，引发了贸易争端。嗯、um, ，But、uh, there there has been there have been、um, investigations in the European Union about、um, supposed charges of, of dumping, and there have been、uh, trade disputes that have arisen about this topic. 中国呢也对进口的多晶硅提高了关税。China, in, retail, in, in response, has、um, put a, increased tariffs for the,、um, this coated silicon. So, yeah, yes, yeah. silicon. This trade mismatch, although it has a reason to be hostile, I think it is still trade protectionism. Now, the governments can have various governments involved can have many uh, uh, discussions on this topic, but. At bottom, I think that this is a form of trade protectionism, as this sort of discussion always is. 但是我认为其结果只是保护了少数公司的利益，而损害了世界上清洁能源的事业。But the the long term effect is that there's been a short term protection of the interests of a few companies at the expense of the ability of the world to continue、um, increasing the the production of clean energy. 事实上，也并没有能够阻止。中国太阳能电池的出口，今年上半年，中国太阳能电池出口还是增加了百分之十八。And in fact, these measures have done nothing to slow the exports of Chinese-made photovoltaics.、Um, in fact,、uh, in the first half of this year, we've seen export production increase by a further eighteen percent. 中国现在在水电、核电、风力发电、太阳能发电这四种清洁能源发电量，已经占了全部发电量的百分之三十。但是这主要是水电做出的贡献。嗯、um, ，So it, in terms of the four key sources of renewable energy,、um, hydro, nuclear, solar, and wind power, if you add them all up, it's close to 30% of China's electricity electric production today. Though we must admit that hydro is is very much the largest percentage of that. 中国和美国在能源生产和消费总量上，呃，刚才讲了，大体上差不多。但是结构有很大的不同，在能源价格上也有很大的不同。Now we've talked about that in terms of consumption and production, the U.S. and China are largely at, on, on a par in terms of energy, but our structures are very different, including our structures of energy pricing. 美国由于页岩气大量的生产，天然气价格现在大概只有呃每个 MMBTU 只有五到六个美金，而中国的价格高达一个 MMBTU 十六到十八美元。Um, the because of shale gas production, the price、um, per mmbtu of gas in the United States has dropped to five or six dollars, whereas、uh, the, in China it would be sixteen to eighteen U.S. dollars equivalent. So, Chinese gas price is three times the price in China. In other words, the price in China for natural gas is roughly three times what it is in the U.S. Another, American gas price is the cheapest. Second is commercial gas price. Third is public gas price. Fourth is cheap gas price. Um, the the uh, uh, it's also true that that prices are kept particularly low for industrial use in the United States, whereas residential use is is、uh, pricing is kept somewhat higher. 美国的工业电价最便最呃，而中国呢刚好倒过来，工业用电是最贵的，大概一个千瓦时要十三美分。Uh, the, it's the opposite in China.、Um, industrial pricing is kept higher. For a, a, every kilowatt is hour is about thirteen U.S. cents. 其次是商业用电，居民用电是最便宜的，大约一个千瓦时七点二五美分。Uh, the commercial use is in the middle, and then residential use is deliberately kept the lowest. It's now at about seven point two five cents U.S. cents per kilowatt hour. 电力消费结构也也很不同。中国工业用电占百分之七十，商业用电占百分之十三，居民生活用电占百分之十二，农业用电占百分之五。Um, and this is, but you, our, our, the structure of energy use is、uh, of electricity use is also very different from that in the United States. In in China, about seventy percent of electricity use goes to industrial production, thirteen percent. To commercial use, 12%.、Um, to uh, uh, residential use, and, and the remainder about 5% to agricultural use. 而美国的商业和居民生活用电比例高达百分之六十到七十，工业用电不到百分之三十。Uh, 
Um, in the U.S., I understand that uh, commercial and residential use combined is somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of total electricity use in the U.S., um, whereas industrial production use is under 30 percent. 刚才他已经提醒我了，我还只剩下一分钟，所以我第二个题目不讲了。<laughs> I, because I, of time, I won't, I won't speak on my second topic. 我想最后一个题目，但这个题目很重要，可能我要超过一分钟。<laughs> my, I, it's a, my last topic will, 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 is very important, so I may go over that one minute. And then, uh, I, I feel that U.S.-China cooperation on energy is extremely crucial, even though there may be some noise, and, uh, uh, but, but, but I don't feel that there are any fundamental conflicts between uh, the policies of our two countries. 中美两国是世界上最大的能源生产国和消费国，在世界能源事务当中举足轻重。We are uh, jointly the world's greatest producers and users of electricity, and we believe and and we need to work together in order to um, improve the situation. We play the very important role in the world energy issues. 由于受长期冷战思维的影响，中国和美国国内都有一些人。把对方作为竞争对手，甚至是假想的敌国。Be、for political reasons, there are people within China and people within the United States who like to make the other country into a scapegoat and talk and uh, talk about um, uh, issues in a way that are, are very pointed. 在能源领域也渲染相互争夺和竞争。Um, in, 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 in the energy environment field, it's important that, that there can be um, cooperation as well as competition. This is Oh, I'm sorry, that there's propaganda, there's, there's exaggeration and propaganda about the, 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 the conflicts that do exist. 其实，从历史和现状仔细分析，中美两国能源合作是基调，并没有相互去争夺能源资源。Um, the truth is that uh, our, the history of our two countries in terms of energy usage and exploration has been relatively independent. It's not as if we have direct conflicts where we're trying to grab each other's resources. 也没有因为能源争夺引发争端，甚至于战争。There has never been any direct conflict, let alone a, a, a battle or a war between the U.S. and China over energy. The first, in fact, the first electric light that was ever lit in China was lit in the 19th century in honor of the visit of President Woodrow Wilson. Uh, lights were lit along the Bund in Shanghai. Uh, to welcome him. In the 40s, the Chinese government signed a cooperative agreement signed between the U.S. government and the then Kuomintang KMT government in China. 98 engineers from China came to the U.S. to study uh, in, in the, 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 the Westinghouse, Westinghouse thank you, uh, Corporation and, and learn about energy technology. In fact, most of those people, when they came back, stayed on in the mainland, did not go to, the, to Taiwan with the KMT, and became some of the, the backbones of developing um, the modern energy technology infrastructure of China. In the 50s and 60s, because of the Vietnam War, the Vietnam War was broken, the two countries broke up. In the 1950s and 1960s, due to conflicts in Korea and in Vietnam, the U.S. and China ended up uh, moving apart and, and terminating um, diplomatic relations. In the 70s, the U.S. and China opened up and In the 1970s, once uh, relations were normalized again between the U.S. and China, uh, one of the first uh, imports that China brought um, in from the United States was again from Westinghouse, uh, 30, uh, uh, 
300 megawatt and 600 megawatt uh, uh, the equipment mm. technology from Westinghouse. Zijing still remains the main generator of Chinese power. And, uh, uh, and uh, even up to the present, this equi the, the equipment of this sort is one of the um, uh, key um, uh, supports in China. The major equipment. Mm -hmm. In this year, uh, it, we once again um, imported AP-1000 nuclear power reactor equipment from Westinghouse, and again, it's, that, that collaboration is part of the key uh, energy cooperation between the two countries. In the United States, the United States was in the early part of the um, period of opening and reform between the United States and China, there was a, I'm sorry, Hamo is... Hamo, Mr. Hamo, invested in Sanxi province, um, Pingshuo. Um, Armand Hammer, thank yes, you. Yes, Mr. yes, Armand Hammer. Coal mine. In a, invested in the coal mine. 美国的 Exxon Mobil, Xuefulong, Kangfei, and Shiyo Gongsi, do jinru zongguo, jinxing yuqi, fengxian kantan. 美国的 Anran, AES, um, U.S. companies from Exxon Mobil, Chevron, um, uh, uh, Kangfei's California, um, ConocoPhillips um, invested heavily in the development of energy in China. Um, Enron was very involved in China, uh, as well as AES and a number of other corporations. Um, Chinese uh, energy companies investing in the United States, although it has not been as large a trend historically, is also, are also uh, starting to increase rapidly recently. For instance, uh, Sinoc has invested several billions of U.S. dollars in shale gas in the United States. 中国的中投公司，中投就是CIC公司，入股十五点八亿美元，成为美国IAS电力公司的最大股东。我也是这个公司的董事。And uh, CIC, which I am one of the uh, the the on the board of, um, has uh, recently made a um, one point five eight billion US dollar become the largest shareholder of AS Electricity Company. I'm the board meeting, uh, board member. How you if he mean she told me go to phone and tell you on the time. There are a number of, uh, of uh, Chinese um, non state owned enterprises which have invested in American photovoltaic and uh, other solar and wind power companies. Are you to go home? A go pizza to me or some to fun go. Yeah, think of that. And then you know, what kind of channel will be one to me. There's very, there's very little direct trade of, ener of energy between the um, U.S. and China other than the 5 million tons of coal that we recently talked about. Yeah, we never import oil and natural gas from the United States. Also, America didn't import any oil and natural gas from China. Never. Yes. So it's a good So the US and China in terms of energy trade have never had any direct conflicts because of of uh, trading energy. In the international market also we didn't compete compete together, such as in the Middle East. Iraq战争以后, in after the Iraq war, um, U.S. Uh, Chinese companies developing China's Iraq oil fields in Iraq uh, invited American companies to participate in its bids. Together with American company together to, mm. to bid it. China from the oil 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 oil
right now, um, crude oil in, it being uh, imported from China from the Middle East is about 50 percent of China's crude imports. 相反，美国从中东进口原油已经下降到进口量的百分之二十八。Um, meantime, uh, China, U.S. imports um, of crude oil have, have dropped to um, about 28 percent, being developed dependent on the Middle East. China also did not suffer from the absence of U.S. imports of crude oil from the Middle East. No. And China has never had any difficulties importing from the Middle East due to the existence of the United States. That's never happened. In dealing with the Middle East and the Middle East, the United States has never had any difficulties importing from the Middle East. 但中国股权大局十分克制，严格遵守联合国的协议，减少了从伊朗进口石油和中断了在伊朗的油气投资。Um, during the period of sanctions against Iran,、um, even though the、uh, issues that led to UN sanctions against Iran had nothing directly to do to China, the, nevertheless, China、um, insisted on abiding by all UN resolutions on this matter and, and str strictly reduced our, our、uh, Uh, trade with Iran because of those sanctions. So, in the world, in other countries, the United States has never been because of the sanctions caused by the oil sector. It is usually the media and a few people who are spreading and exploiting it. So, really, there have been no con direct conflicts between the U.S. and China, specifically because of energy.、Um, where there have been, I believe that it's the uh, uh, prejudice of the media or of a small number of persons who choose to focus on those issues. These people are trying to imagine the truth. 相反，中美两国在新能源领域开展了广泛的合作，成立了中美清洁能源中心，也签订了和平利用原子能协议。The the these people are always seeking for、uh, some sort of a of a of a plot, but the truth is,、um, we we believe that there's much greater opportunity for open cooperation between the two sides, such as represented by the agreement that we've signed with the、uh, with the committee. 我观察，中美两国的政治领导人。都保持了清醒的头脑，维护中美两大国的合作关系，这才是两国在能源领域合作的主流。Um, I, I believe that,、uh, that through cooperation such as the one we're here at here today, we can continue to move forward into, in the mainstream of U.S.-Chinese、uh, energy collaboration. This I haven't yet finished, but he has already done it many times. 我因为觉得这个问题太重要，所以我就 over time， 我要把它讲完。<笑> I, I, I know I'm over time. I want, I believe this problem is too important. I wanted to stress it again. 因为你们给我这机会也不容易啊，谢谢。<笑> Thank you. Minister, I want to thank you for those extremely thoughtful and informative remarks. I, I hope, in particular, the last portion of your remarks on U.S.-China relations. I, I hope that you'll publish that and send it around because I think it's extremely interesting and informative.、Uh, I'm delighted to welcome to the stage next、uh, a terrific panel, which is going to be moderated by Ken Lieberthal. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Ken Lieberthal,、uh, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington.、Uh, we have、uh, three panelists here.、Uh, I'm not going to do long introductions because we have very little time and want to get a, have an opportunity for、uh, interaction both on the panel and、uh, for people in the audience to、uh, raise questions.、Uh, sitting directly to my left is、uh, Dr. Chen Wei Dong. Who is chief energy researcher of the Energy Economics Institute of the Chinese National Offshore Oil Corporation?、Uh, then, in the middle,、uh, Joanna Lewis, who is assistant professor of science, technology, and international affairs at Georgetown、uh, University, has done a great deal of work on clean energy in China.、Uh, and last, but by no means least, Professor Xu Xiaojie, who is director of、uh, the director of the World Energy. Uh, uh, in the Institute of World Economics and Politics of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences,、uh, national ministerial level uh, body, uh, the uh, I guess my my fundamental question, and I'd ask each of you to give your your kind of brief take on this, is、uh, as we heard, the U.S. and China are the two largest energy producers. Two largest energy consumers, two largest greenhouse gas emitters.、Uh, 
You have the two largest automotive markets in the world. Uh, in many ways, what we can do, if we can move ahead on um, meeting uh, the, our energy needs without dramatically increasing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, we will serve a leadership role in the world on this. If we can't, frankly, most of the rest of the world is going to think that uh, if we can't take up responsibility for this, then others uh, certainly should not bear the burden. Uh, I guess my question is China is now, unlike the U.S., is now increasing its greenhouse gas emissions. Still has a long way to go in raising uh, the level of urbanization to what, to what it seeks, and urbanization, in fact, will increase. Its rate of, of, uh, of building new floor space is the highest in the world. Its rate of increase in new car sales, new vehicle sales, is the highest in the world and will continue to grow rapidly by all accounts. So my question is, as you look ahead, how do you see China's greenhouse gas emissions uh, moving? How long will they be moving up? Uh, when do you expect them to level off? And what is the key issue to your mind? This is obviously too complicated to ask for a key issue, but I'm going to do it anyway. What is the key issue that we should be focusing on as we look to see what China's record is likely to be on this? And why don't we start, if we can, with uh, Professor Xu, uh, who I know has done a great deal of work on this, and then go down the line. Professor Xu. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for the questions. Uh, good evening. Uh, good question, actually. Uh, China is the uh, largest energy consumer and producer in the world. So we have seen, and this morning, actually, I made a presentation on the energy outlook uh, based on the uh, best understanding of Chinese policy, existing policies. We believe energy uh, consumption will be continue to increase. Uh, from now a uh, level, today's level, to a uh, much higher level uh, to in the year 2030 at the uh, uh, growth rate will be a 2.06. So it means the energy demand will be keeping uh, up, upward, and uh, level the level of uh, level it, uh, after the 2020. So that means the uh, uh, carbon emission will be increased accordingly as well. Uh, because um, uh, the energy structure, the energy consumption very much dominated by the fossil fuel, uh, mainly uh, coal. So we have to uh, dealing with all the issues because the, the carbon increase uh, dramatically. Uh, but also we have to think about how to deal with the uh, carbon emissions. You know, uh, as uh, uh, now China has become a big uh, CO two emitters. So we have to think about all the issues. First of all, we have to see the situation. The change is going to like this way, but we also think about how to deal with the issues inside. So first uh, and the most important thing is how to deal with the coal. Today, coal is really is a little bit dirty because of the high emission, CO2 emissions, and other type of the, uh, emitters from the coal consumption. But also, we have, at the same time, I think about uh, the coal is our situation. Because the coal is so dominated of uh, the energy consumption, according to the, the energy resources, coal almost take 94%. This is a reality. We have to live with the coal. We cannot live without the coal in China from now on. So coal is the issue, is dirty today, but we have to think about making the coal cleaner in the future. This is the fundamental things for us now. Thank you very much. Joanna, let, let me focus the question a little bit. You, you can give the answer you want to give, but let me also ask you, is there any such thing as clean coal, uh, especially clean coal that is competitive with other sources of energy? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that that's a, an important question. And when you ask what the, the crucial thing is for China, I think many, thing, many people would say coal uh, is, is going to be central uh, because it plays such a big share. And learn, looking for ways that you can... Uh, burn coal more cleanly will be key to that. I don't actually think we have clean coal today. I think we have a lot of um, technologies which are under development, both in China and the United States, uh, which could, I mean, depending how you define clean coal, if your issue is CO2 emissions, you can start to capture it. Um, so I think we're moving in that direction. 
Um, but I actually think that coal is only part of the problem and that the bigger challenge for China in the coming years is total demand and, and slowing demand growth. Um, if, if the economy can become more efficient, um, we saw a chart earlier this evening uh, from David Sandelow that there's a, a long way to go in terms of reducing energy intensity in China. Um, and only when you can make uh, energy consumption more efficient can renewables and other cleaner sources of energy start to play a bigger share in the total energy mix. Um, we've seen extremely rapid growth in renewables in China, as was mentioned earlier. Um, and I think that it's really worth noting that we're seeing a, a notable shift um, out of the 12th five-year plan period uh, in the role that clean energy is playing in China. Uh, while it's still a small share uh, in terms of total electricity generation, uh, less than 5% coming from uh, non-hydro renewables, uh, as well as nuclear. Uh, if you look at what's being built in China in terms of new power plant capacity, uh, in 2013, for the first time, China actually built more new uh, non-fossil plants than they did fossil plants. And that's for the first time ever. Uh, you know, we had seen uh, record amounts of coal plants being built in China for the last decade, and we're actually seeing that start to slow. Uh, and electricity consumption uh, slowing as well. So I think this is a really positive sign. Um, and. You know, part of this has been achieved because of the, uh, the policies that have put in place to increase uh, the use of wind energy, the use of solar energy. Uh, I think it is worth noting that China installed more solar last year than any country's ever been able to achieve in a single year uh, as a result of the policy incentives put in place there. Uh, so while the shares are small, I think the direction is important. And in terms of how this translates into carbon emissions, um, I think that already you're hearing, uh, when we start to think about coal demand slowing, um, and potentially even leveling off uh, in the coming uh, one to two decades. Uh, carbon emissions trajectories in China start to look quite different than we were predicting just a few years ago. Uh, I hate to make predictions because we are frequently wrong <laughs> about uh, where carbon emissions may grow, uh, may go uh, for China, but um, I do think that the fact that uh, we are now hearing a discussion of, of eventual uh, leveling off and even a peaking of carbon emissions in China, these were words that were never um, really mentioned just a, a few years ago, and, and I don't mean just by, uh, you know, researchers like myself, um, but by, you know, very senior uh, researchers and officials within China. So I think this is a positive sign uh, as the world looks to uh, an, a new international climate deal, um, and I think the, the steps we've seen coming out of Washington in terms of carbon emissions uh, regulations are another positive step. Thank you. Uh, okay. Do? Uh, so recently, I make I, I do some study on the China, U.S. oil industry cooperation history. Just like Zhang Guobao just mentioned, we have long cooperation history over 100 years. The first China-U.S. joint venture oil company set up in 1914, 100 years ago. That is strongly influences the China oil industry. In that period, the so-called China poor oil reserve country, the result is come out of this cooperation. But second time is very important. Just when China opened up, Carter invited the China oil delegation visit US to set up the joint venture, CNOOC, for the joint venture company. So in that visit, we start the second cooperation. We adopt the modern oil industry concept, technology, and uh, uh, management. The third time is uh, early 2000. The three oil company, major oil company, public New York. I'm trained by Exxon in 1980, 1985, 1986 for the second corporation as a geophysicist. The first time I visit New York, 2007, for the first China oil services company, IPO, in New York. So this three time corporation is to make a great shaping of the Chinese oil industry right now. But review the last 100 years cooperation, three things I think are very important for next step of our cooperations. We have to cooperate, just like Zhang Guobao said, we have to do that. First of all, I think that politicians make the major role 
for the corporation. They are set up the foundation. The political policy of the two countries heavily influences the cooperation of the industry. If uh, no foundation, no the long-term view of the politicians, will no oil cooperation. Second, the company, how the company cooperate each other, make uh, the cooperation sustainable or not sustainable. Now, China oil industry structure is diff very different from U.S. In U.S., there are thousands, even 10,000 oil company, but most the medium and the small. Okay. It's very active. China has uh, no this end. I think the first cooperation way, how we created that small, middle and small company, more active, more practice, productive small oil company in China. That is not many or almost none. Second, the major oil company like Exxon Mobil, uh, CNPC, uh, Chevron, Sinopec, Chronicle Phillips, and the CNOC, they can cooperate in more broad way, in the international way. Very interesting, just like Zhang Guobao said, U.S. and China never had the, 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 the depend on each other, oil and the gas, but we are really heavily related with Russia about the real oil and gas supply. And also see the 100 years history, China, Russia, US, the triangle, always there, always there. So that's really our think of how we can go operating for the next step. Being a scholar, we must convince um, the company in enterprise also need to convince our politicians. That's what I want to say. <laughs> uh, that raises a lot of food for thought, but uh, Professor Xu? Yes, I would like to add more comments on the environment issues, the energy and environment issues. I have when we're very, okay. very short. When we're so facing the environment issues, we also immediately think about how to reduce the consumption of the coal. This is, this is, right. This is the right direction we have to say, you know. And now uh, the renewable uh, consumption is a very low level in China. We have to think about the increase, the non-fossil fuel renewable uh, consumption increases. But also we have to, again, think about how to make the coal cleaner. Actually, if we talk about the coal, actually, we cannot complain, you know, the coal as a main source of the CO2 emissions. Actually, now CO2 emission from coal consumption is really from the direct burning of the coal. Actually, some CO2 emission from the, the coal power generation is very limited and controllable. This is my point. I believe in the future, near zero emission will be possible for the coal fire generations. Uh, does that and that means to make the coal much cleaner. Does that also require uh, coal capture, CO2 capture and sequestration? Yeah. Doesn't that uh, Increase the cost of coal. Yes, yes. Increase the cost. Increase the technology requirements and, and technology, you know, innovation. This is something we uh, we have to deal with seriously. And, and but do you think that China will? You think that China will say in the next 15 years try to deploy CCS coal yes. capture and sequestration, carbon capture and sequestration, or CCUS yeah. coal capture. Yeah. Uh, utilization sequestration yeah. on a large scale? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I think now there is uh, uh, many uh, technology routes we should to uh, use, the, for example, uh, IGCC and mm -hmm. uh, uh, ultra supercritical uh, power generation. This is uh, a very mature technology now. We very much recognize the importance and useful for uh, the, the coal fire generations. But uh, simply because of some the cost, you know, issues we have to deal with. So, but uh, we have to make this possible through the economic reform and the policy incentives to make the sense of dealing with uh, this issue, plus CCUS. Uh, let me open this up to uh, the audience for questions that you want to raise. This is fundamentally about where China's economic reforms are headed and how that impacts 
uh, on China's environment, uh, on carbon emissions, and potential areas for U.S.-China cooperation. Kind of within that broad sphere, I know we have a lot of expertise out in the audience. Uh, anyone want to raise? Yes, over here, and please, uh, there's a roving microphone, isn't there? Yes, if you wait just a moment. Here we go. You please just uh, indicate who you are and feel free to direct a question to one person or another I'm on the I'm Roma Stibravi, president of NGO Sustainability, and my question is directed to the climate summit that the Secretary General of the United Nations will be having on September 23rd. And of course, if it is to have any meaning, China and the U.S. have to be ready to make some comments. Uh, I'd like to know China, what the thinking in China is right now. Does anyone want to respond to that? Or what kind of commitment is China thinking about making hmm. on, at the uh, meeting in, at the UN on the 23rd? Yeah. I think the, the summit is coming, uh, as I know from, the, uh, from media. Uh, again, you know, based on our research, I think you know, China can contribute build a great deal to reduce the CO2 emissions, especially based on our research. Uh, I think, you know, uh, the energy intensity or uh, carbon intensity can be increased in the much uh, large uh, percentages uh, from my, uh, all of my presentations, you know. There's a big room uh, to, to cooperate. During this summit, uh, I think, you know, technology exchange, especially for green coal, should be uh, focused. And maybe I could just add briefly, yeah. I mean, I, I think that um, it's, it's quite notable that uh, China is already experimenting with uh, several pilot cap-and-trade programs for carbon dioxide emissions uh, in several different provinces and municipalities, and uh, the government has said that this is going to lay the foundation eventually for a national program. So I think you know, what we're looking for from China, things to watch out for, will be um, you know, the timing of such announcements. Uh, I think we're likely to see some form of carbon target again in the 13th five-year plan, just as we did in the 12th five-year plan. Um, but we don't know yet exactly what form that will take. Will it be an intensity-based target, uh, an absolute target, and when, when such figures may be announced uh, leading up, you know, any time, I think, between the UN meeting and the, the Paris negotiations in 2015 uh, is certainly what the world is, would be looking towards. Yes, Becky? Yes, ma'am? I'm sorry if you wait for the microphone. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jane Marchant. I'm a Columbia University. Hello, at the LENFEST Center for Sustainable Energy. Um, a big part of that as well is the carbon tax, and that's a big reality for solving climate change. How much of an actual detriment to the Chinese economy would installing a carbon tax be? Well, uh, you know, there is some history here. China was, as I recall, uh, focused quite a bit on developing a carbon tax approach. Uh, until about four years ago when the notion of a carbon tax took second place to the notion of developing cap and trade. And uh, there are now seven experimental uh, cap and trade systems being tried out and they'll be, experience will be summed up and I suspect a national uh, regime is hopefully going to be rolled out around 2016. Uh, why go to a cap and trade system instead of carbon tax, given the potential of potentially greater simplicity uh, of a carbon tax as an approach. Cap and trade is a very, very complicated way to put a price on carbon. Uh, thoughts? <laughs> Please, I, actually I have no comment on these issues, you know. Uh, Cabin tax and cabin trading are two options. You know, for some uh, officials may prefer to take uh, uh, carbon tax. I have no uh, more uh, research on the issue. Maybe they take this easy way. You know, mm -hmm. to start up. Yeah, I mean, I think a, a price on carbon either way would <laughs> would certainly be important for incentivizing the types of technologies we're talking about. But I think another thing to look towards that, which could be even more important in the short term, would be uh, electricity pricing reform and and reforms on on fossil fuel pricing in China. I mean, coal is extremely cheap right now in China. We were discussing a lot today about pricing of, of resources. And I, and I think if, if, if coal were more expensive, whether through a carbon tax or another sort of a reform, uh, that could be very important for disincentivizing uh, continued use.
Anyone else from the floor? Yes. Thank you. There's a microphone coming back to you on the side. A student at Columbia University. And I have a quick question. So anecdotally, I've heard that enforcing um, policies in China has not really been too effective in terms of like carbon scrubbers and things like that. So I was wondering if A, that's true, and B, how you could increase enforcement for those um, sorts of policies moving forward. I'm sorry, how do you see enforcement of what? Like carbon scrubbers and things like that for um, coal power plants. In other words, have, have Should, I can rephrase the question. Please. So, so I've heard anecdotally that um, people will turn off scrubbers or turn on scrubbers when you know uh, inspectors come around and then turn them off, and there's sort of been an enforcement issue. And I don't mm -hmm. know a if that's true, but is that true? And then b, um, how can that uh, compliance be increased? I can start. Maybe others uh, can join in. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think that one thing that's been really interesting are the the new targets that have been put in place for the air pollution problems that we've seen in the, in the last year or so uh, are being very aggressively enforced. Um, you know, we've heard about uh, leaders in China taking direct control for these targets being met um, and officials' promotions being tied to their ability to meet these air pollution. Uh, and coal reduction targets. So um, I think, of course, there are always challenges uh, with enforcement in, in such a, a large country where um, there's many different incentives at the local level um, for economic development, depending on what industry is driving uh, the local economy. But I do think we see enforcement moving in the right direction. The coal yeah. re realism and uh, the environment idealism always conflict in almost every country, in China especially like that. In, in coal now, for MMB2, counted by MMB2, only $3 MMB2 for using coal. But in China, just like Zhang Guobao said, our, our gas, LNG, import LNG is around the 16 to 18 dollar per MMBTU. So China now, the smoke is uh, very serious. So everybody impacted by the wars and the worsened pollution. We really want to reduce the pollution. But being the major countries, reduce the coal percentages is quite difficult. Today's China, almost half coal was directly burned in the countryside or small town. That is make the most pollution and the emissions. It's not the modern coal electricity power station. That will relate directly to our infrastructure. 1.3 billion people, still half people in the countryside. How that can improve is not only the public can make a decision, can achieve. We still need that. many, many investment, long time to work to change it. Just like U.S. If no Shell gas revolution is cannot imagine now the American coal plant drop down 50%. If no shell gas revolution cannot down to today's about 40. China also very focused on shell gas and also focus on import both pipeline and the LNG. China-Russian deal is the biggest ever, the pipeline gas import. 400 billion for next 20 years. 
but the volume only account to our plan 10% anyway. 10% even the Russian pipeline coming. So it's a big country, big population. All the things we really want to change overnight, but that cannot. The, uh, at the common back to your questions here about uh, the environment policy. Actually, uh, we have serious environment policies uh, uh, in China, and the message from them is quite clear. I just uh, mentioned uh, two examples. One is uh, uh, thermal power uh, atmosphere uh, pollution standards. This uh, um, uh, restriction released in the year 2011, they have very strict uh, requirements for the existing uh, thermal power uh, uh, pollution uh, close to the near zero emissions. And they also have uh, close requirements for the, to be built. New, uh, new coal-fired generations built the, after the year to, uh, 2014, that will be close to the requirements as well. And another one is uh, a plan for action uh, against uh, atmosphere pollution. Uh, we mentioned this early morning. This uh, message is also very clear for uh, the policymakers at the uh, national level and the provincial level as well. Every company, every region in the company have to uh, strictly to follow the restrictions and requirements. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, our time uh, has come to a, to, to a conclusion. Uh, we've, we've had just an opportunity to, to get some taste of how complex these issues are. Uh, China is trying to restructure the composition of its GDP, accelerate urbanization, maintain high levels of employment, uh, faces an enormous water shortage throughout North China, and wants to shift its energy base all at the same time. Uh, this is a, an extraordinarily complicated, wide-ranging, and inevitably uncertain uh, path forward. Uh, the goals are ambitious. As uh, David Sandalos and uh, Minister John Guo Bao's uh, introductory uh, speeches uh, made very clear how China fares in this will be of enormous consequence, not only to China, not only to global energy markets, but to the global environment and to the quality of life that all of us uh, are able to have uh, in the coming decades. Uh, so I want to thank our panelists uh, for contributing their wisdom uh, to these issues.